All right, we are going to finish up. This is lesson lesson three, and it'll be part three of lesson three. We we'll make our way through uh, uh, this series of studies, and I'm thankful for the opportunity to to do this and, uh, and kind of work through this material. I think it's been I know it's been helpful for me, and I know others have 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 spoken to that effect. Now, this one's going to. This lesson will be a little bit, it will be different, but we have to remember, it's the continuation of what we studied last week. And we closed out last week looking at the one baptism of the New Testament. Uh, that it is immersion in water, it is for those who believe, hear the gospel, believe the gospel, and desire to obey the gospel. And it brings uh, to the recipient the remission of sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we, we, we set that uh, we set that stage as where we closed off to, to move uh, to page 10 uh, in our study today. So on page 10, uh, we'll start at the top of that page. Of course, there's our, our book copy. As always, we read the scriptures aloud and then uh, ask our students to, to read and to answer. Again, just for the sake of... of uh, sound and time I'll read uh, the various texts and we'll make our way through make our way through the passages in John chapter 14 and in verse number 15 Jesus said if you love me keep my commandments um, so we the question is you know if we really love Jesus will we want to obey him and the answer of course is yes now you might add just on the side there at the end, you might add or just write down verse 21. Because in this same text it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them is he who loves me. And then you have also in 1 John, uh, 1 John chapter, uh, uh, chapter uh, well, we'll say 5. And in verse number... Two and three. It says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. And so, just you know, a couple other passages there that speak about uh, the connection uh, between love uh, and obedience. And so, then the and again, remember, this is, you know, these are the lessons as they would be presented to a non-Christian. And so a lot of these, I won't, I won't put an answer because only the person that we're studying with can answer uh, the question. So if there's a scripture, there'll be an answer. If there's not a scripture, there's probably not going to be an answer. So we ask the question, you know, do you love Jesus? Do you want to obey Jesus? And then still there on 10 says, since Jesus wants you to be baptized, and now that you understand the importance of being baptized right now, would it please Jesus for you to be baptized right now? And, uh, and of course, the answer to that question, uh, answer that question is yes. Yes. Once a person hears, understands, and believes the gospel, then that is the, ti that is the time for obedience. Um, Brother Wendell Winkler uh, said one time, and I'd never considered it, but he said it, and what he said was true. He said, you will not find anywhere in the New Testament where anyone ate, drank, or slept between the time that they heard and believed the gospel and the time of their baptism. No one. Now think about that. No one ever ate. No one ever drank. No one ever slept between their understanding of the gospel of Christ and their baptism. And so, obviously, that would preclude that would preclude people being saved until you had enough to make it worth your while to have a baptism service at somewhere you know at some point down the road. And so, but uh, but it is true, you know, when they heard the day of Pentecost, you know, when they heard this, you know, they were pricked in their heart, and then they that gladly received his word were baptized and added into them what that day, that day about 3,000 souls. You get Acts chapter 8. When they heard the things that Philip preached concerning uh, uh, the, the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. You know, the, the key word is when. 
When they heard these things, and implied as they believed them, they were, they were baptized. The, the uh, jailer of Acts 16, he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and was baptized. In other words, he took them out of the prison so that he could go to a place where, where, he, could, where he and his household, having heard the word of God, uh, could be baptized. And so uh, I, think that's a, I think it's a great point Brother Winkler makes, and it's certainly it, it, it's historically and biblically uh, accurate. And then, of course, there are these names. Do you wear the name of Christ only? Uh, that is given in consideration that there are no such thing, or there is no such thing as a hyphenated Christian. You know, you say, well, what, you know, what, you know, well, what are you? Well, I'm a Christian. Well, what kind of Christian are you? Well, again, if you're going by the Bible, there is no other kind of Christian. There, there are Christians and there are non-Christians. You know, it, it used to be there used to be Jews and proselytes and Gentiles. But now there's just Christians and non-Christians. There are not types of Christians, categories uh, of Christians. And so, uh, you know, we wear the name Christian. That's the name that God gave. Uh, that's the name that God gave his people in Acts 11 and verse 26. Uh, it's the name that Isaiah prophesied would be given to God's people in Isaiah 62, uh, that they would be given a new name, and that is the name of Christians. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. That's what it means only to wear the name of Christ. Um, and then these, are, of course, these are follow-up questions from lessons one and two with regard to worship, with regard to the observance of the Lord's Supper, with regard to the music. Uh, in worship. Does the church you attend worship according to the Bible? Is the church you attend organized according uh, to the Bible? Does the church you attend teach God's plan of salvation? Now, I, this one I think, well, let me put it this way. This not I think. This question is particularly interesting to me because when I studied with, uh, with my dad's mom back in the Probably about 97, 98, you know, been a long time ago. Um, and, and no, probably even farther back than that. But we were studying, and, uh, and she was a member of a local denomination there in town, and, and we were studying the plan of salvation. And I just wrote all the steps down in random order. As a matter of fact, I didn't even write them in order. I just, you know, wrote them facing different ways, and so there's no, there's no rhyme or reason uh, to them. And as we walked through the various biblical texts, and she, we were studying and talking about these things, uh, once we read all the various texts, I said, now, now we've read that the Bible tells us we have to do all of these things, right? And she said, yes. I said, so now, I said, now what I want you to do is I want you to put these things in order for me. I want you to put them in order for me. All these steps. You know, piece of cake. I, you know, she's like, well, you got to hear before you can do anything. You know, and then, then, then you got to believe, and then, then you repent, and then if you repent, you'll confess, and then, then you're baptized, and then you're saved. And she put them all in, she put them all right there in order. I mean, without any help. And so I said, I said, grandmother, I said, is that what you did to be saved? And of course, she already knew the answer. To that was no, because we had already talked about what had happened when she was saved, and I had it written down. And, um, and she said, no, that's not what I did. And here's what she said. She said, um, but I just believe in my heart if I, I died, the Lord will save me. Well, we talked a little bit more along those lines, and uh, then she said this. She said, she pointed to the list. She said, can I do that and keep going to the church that, I, that I'm at now? And I said, I'm going to ask you one. I said, why would you, why would you a, attend a church that doesn't teach you or anyone else what the Bible says in order to be saved? But she didn't do it. Because she wasn't willing, and this is my, my opinion, okay? This is my assessment of the situation. She wasn't willing to deal with all the garbage that would come if she left the church that she'd been a member of for 50 years to go do what she knew was right. She didn't want to have to explain it. 
Basically, what she wanted, it's, she wanted to be baptized under the cloak of darkness and, and, and get right, but then go back and not suffer basically any consequences or give any explanations. And she never did, she never did do what was right. But she knew what was right because she, she wrote it down on paper. She, she, she put it together. And so that's why, that's why this, is an, this is why this is an important thing to think about. Because some people will want to do just like she wanted to do. They'll want to do what's right. You know, Shannon Mays and I studied with a guy a long time ago. And, uh, and he wanted to do what was right. And he did what was right, but he didn't want to do what was right and make the change long term that he needed to make. And he didn't. He didn't. And so, uh, so you know, these are, very important, these are very important questions. And so, you know, they're not just, they're not just random or, 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 without, or without purpose. All right, our next text is Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 23. Ephesians 3 and verse 23 says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Now, Jesus is the Savior of the what? You say body or body or church works in this, in this case. Yeah. He's the Savior, you know, he's the head of the body and, uh, and the Savior of the, the body. And the church is also called, well, I'm going to read it. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning verse 22. This is talking about what God has done for Jesus, or to Jesus. And He, that's God the Father, put all things under His feet, God the Son, and gave Him, God the Son, to be head over all things to the church, which is His body. So the church is also called the body of Christ. He's the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the church. The church is the body of of Christ. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. How many bodies are there? How many bodies? One. There's one body. Now, again, this is also a very important concept because there's one head and one body. And yet, in the religious world as it, as it exists today, there are literally thousands of bodies all claiming to be what? Part of the one head. And we all understand that won't work. There, you know, there's not one body with many heads, and there's not one head with many bodies. And just as a, just as a quick aside, John 15 is the explanation uh, of why the churches can't be all part of the same body. You know, John 15, verses 1 through 8 is the text uh, on, uh, I am the vine and you are the branches. By the way, this was the first text Jeffrey ever preached from. I, I remember it well. He preached from John 15, 1 to 8. He's probably still got the outline. I saved it for him. He should better still have it. But, uh, but you are the branches speaks to individual people and not to groups of people. And the very nature of a vine is that it only produces one fruit. And therefore you can't have a singular vine producing a variety, a variety of completely different types of fruit. So John 15, John 15 is not the answer to, well, all the bodies are just part of the one head. Well, we're all just body parts. It, won't work. it just won't work. Then, then the question, do you want to be in the church or body that Jesus has promised to save? Uh, another passage again, 1 Corinthians 15, um, uh, 23 to 25 says, When Jesus comes back, He's going to deliver up the kingdom to God. Even the Father. He's going to come back and deliver up the church. It's the, only, it's the only church, it's the only body, it's the only group, the only assembly that is going to be gathered by the Lord and given to His Father when He comes back. Uh, not, again, not the, most multiplicity of, not the multiplicity of bodies. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13. It says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and I've all been made to drink into 
one spirit. So the question is, how does one get into the Lord's body or the church? And the answer is baptism. Now, this is not a reference to Holy Spirit baptism. Some people say, well, see that right? You're baptized, but you're baptized by the Holy Spirit. Well, there's a problem with that. Because... Earlier we studied in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 that there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And what type of baptism do we find recurring repeatedly through the book of Acts? Which kind is it? It's water baptism. That's right. It's water baptism. You know, Philip and the eunuch. You know, water baptism. You know, Acts 2, um, Acts 8, Acts 18, Acts 10. Um, you know, it's water... It's water baptism. So water baptism has to be the one baptism of Ephesians 4 verse 5. And so what, what the teaching of 1 Corinthians 12 is, is that it's through the teaching of one spirit that we're all baptized. In other words, the, the, the same spirit tells us all to do the same thing. To do the same thing. And, and also to, to borrow from the same book wherein this text is found, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul's talking about well, you said you, you know, some were baptized in the name of Paul. Or some, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul, so I'm a Cephas, so I'm a Christ. Well, were you baptized in the name of Paul? He said, I thank my God that I didn't baptize any of you except four. Well, if Holy Spirit baptism is the means by which one gets into one body, how did Paul administer it? How did Paul administer it? Obviously, Paul did not administer Holy Spirit baptism. And so we are, uh, we are uh, added to the one body uh, by baptism. Uh, another side, uh, Galatians 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So we have then uh, the next set of questions. Do you want Jesus to add you to his church? Now, I'm not crazy about this question because... There's been no discussion of Acts 2.41 and 2.47. Those are the two added passages. So write down next to that on your hand out there. Under that question, do you want Jesus to add you to his church? Acts 2.41, Acts 2.47. You know, they that gladly received his word were baptized and they were added unto them that day about 3,000 souls. Then Acts 2 and verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And so, I, in other words, I don't like that. I, look, and, and for somebody who has not been studying it, they, they may well get it. They may well understand. But I just don't like the use of the word add there without a little bit of biblical context. Okay? And so, do you want Jesus to add you to the church and win? All right, James 4. James 4 and verse 13 and 14. James 4. Verses 13 and 14. Come now you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy, sell, and get profit, whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So the question is, do you know for certain you will be alive tomorrow? Of course, the answer to that question is no. The answer is no. We do not know that if we will be alive uh, tomorrow. Um, Proverbs 27 and verse 1. I went ahead and put these on the, on the screen for you. Proverbs 27 and verse 1. Do not boast yourself of tomorrow, for you do not know what tomorrow will bring. I mean, and I don't want to open a wound, but let's, let's be honest. You know, Dennis wasn't planning on being at the funeral home last week. You know, he did. You know, he didn't. He didn't get up Sunday or Monday and say, "You know what? I think I'm going to go to the funeral home this week and prepare to bury my mother." Right? How many people be at the funeral home today or tomorrow or the next day who today or yesterday had no plans whatsoever to be at the funeral home? That's the, that's the point. The point is, we do not know. We do not know. David said in 1 Samuel 20 and verse 3, he says, there is but a step between me and death. Now he said that based on the fact that Saul was trying to kill him. And David's like, you know what? He may well succeed. 
He may well succeed. And, you know, and if he does, I'll be gone. There's but a step between me and death. And then, of course, the, the, the question is, if you were to die right now, would you go to heaven? Only the, only the person can, under, uh, can answer that question for themselves. All right, 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 2. For he says, in an accepted time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Now, I think the text here is speaking overall to the Christian age. That now is the accepted time. This is the time the prophets were talking about. This is the day of salvation that the prophets were talking about. This is it. I don't think he's talking about like issuing the invitation to the Corinthians but nevertheless, it still remains true. Nobody was ever saved tomorrow. Nobody ever obeyed the gospel tomorrow. Nobody ever came back to the Lord tomorrow. You know, if it's going to be done, it has to be done. It has to be done today. So when is the accepted time? The accepted time is now. And when is the day of salvation? That day is today. You can't be saved tomorrow. Has God promised you another day to make things right? No. I'll give you one example of this. For a number of years, uh, and he's since deceased, Daryl Davis held a number of meetings uh, at the Burleson Church through the years. Daryl Davis was my Uncle Reed's roommate at Freed Hardman. Uh, Daryl preached up at the Petersville Church up in the, in the Quad Cities area. And um, Daryl's father was not a Christian. And he had been pleading with him and pleading with him and pleading with him to obey the gospel. And finally, his dad was in the hospital and relented. And he called Daryl and he said, Daryl, he said, told him, he said, I want to be baptized. I know I need to be baptized. Daryl said, that's great. He said, I'm on my way to the hospital right now. I said, we'll get, a, we'll get a whirlpool or we'll find some means at the hospital and we'll get it done tonight. His dad said, no. He said, said it's too late. It's too late. We'll wait till tomorrow. Guess what happened? What happened, Woodard? That's right. He died. He died. He died the night that he said he wanted to be baptized the next day. Now, what's the Bible say? The Bible says, He who believes is baptized shall be saved. You know what it says? That's yeah. what it says. And so, I mean, and that's, you know, that's not just some deathbed story. I mean, that actually happened. You know, that happened to somebody I know. And so, uh, you know, I'd never, I'd never want to, I'd never want to delay anything that I knew to be right when, when it pertains to my salvation. Because the question, you know, when should you be baptized into Christ? It, the answer is not now. The answer is when I've understood and believed the gospel of Christ. That's when, that's when you should be baptized. When you understand and believe the gospel of Christ. You know, now is not the time if you've not been properly taught. Now is not the time if you don't believe. Now is not the time if you don't understand. If those be the case, then we can work, we can work to that end. Okay? That, that's not the issue. We can work through that. But if, you, if you've heard and you believe, and you, if you heard and you understand and you believe, then the answer is right now. Right now. All right, Revelation chapter 14 and verse 11. I'll begin in verse 10. It says, He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Will those in hell be tormented forever? The answer is yes. Will they ever have any rest? No. No rest day or night. You know, then the question, you know, would you want to suffer with them forever in that awful place? By the way, hell's created for the devil and his angels. It's not created for men. But it will be where all those who are not uh, obedient and faithful to the Lord uh, will reside. All right, Revelation 20 and verse 15.
At the end of the great judgment scene, it says, Anyone whose name was not found in the book of life was cast, what? Into the lake of fire. And getting the question, is your name written in God's book of life? Is it written there? Only you can answer. Does God want to write your name in the book of life? He most certainly does. And then the question is, what must you do to have your name recorded in God's book of life? God can write your name in and He can take it out. Revelation 22, 19. I mean, God, uh, even in the chapter 2, you know, to him who overcomes, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. So God writes names in, God takes names out, God can put names back in. It's just that simple. God controls, you know, God controls the book. And so what must you do to have your name recorded in that book of life? Whether it Obey the gospel and be baptized, be restored. You know, do you want him to write it in there now? In Matthew 12 and verse 30. He who is not with me is against me. He who does not uh, sow with me scatters abroad. Jesus said if we are not with him, we are what? We are against him. There is no middle ground. There is no middle ground. You know, man once said, said, you know, I don't go to church with my wife and kids, but I don't hinder them. And the preacher asked him, he said, have you ever tried to plow with two mules and one of them dead? And just because you think you don't stand in the way doesn't mean you're not a hindrance. I mean, the straightforward teaching is this means that we are either on the Lord's side or Satan's side. We're either helping the cause of Jesus or we're helping the cause of Satan. Have you ever considered that not doing what is right is actually helping Satan and his cause? It's actually helping Satan and his cause. The refusal to do what is right by those who need to obey the gospel is helping the, is helping the devil. And God forbid any of us ever be found helping the devil. Because when we do obey the gospel, we're helping the cause of Christ. Number one, in our own benefit, but then in the benefit of those who are encouraged by such, who have already enjoyed that benefit, and through the encouragement of those who will be encouraged. I mean, you remember about a year ago when we had one of our young people obey the gospel? What happened? What happened? It was an encouragement, it was an encouragement for others to give serious consideration to the, to the situation of their souls. Okay. So, had the first one not done that, what was, what was he doing? He was helping Satan. Not only that, he was helping his own church mates go to hell by not doing what he knew was right. But when he did what was right, what happened? The very opposite of that. Helping them. All right, God's conditions of salvation. He is the author of eternal salvation to all them that obey him. Jesus will save those who what? Who obey him. And the question then is, are you ready to obey Jesus' command to be baptized? Must we obey Jesus to be saved eternally? We do. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to go ahead and just, I'll stop with this one. It says, must we follow Jesus faithfully to be saved eternally? The answer is yes. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Revelation 2 and verse 10. So this is, real, this is a good stopping point as we think about the need to obey the gospel or to return uh, to faithfulness as, as we think about um, uh, those, uh, those matters. Let me turn this off. So we extend the invitation to those. Many of you have been here week after week. You've heard what the Bible, you've heard what the Bible teaches. Uh, about the need uh, to be a part of the body of Christ, to obey the gospel of Christ, how to obey the gospel of Christ, and now uh, to continue in faith uh, in the gospel uh, of Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you need to obey the gospel of Christ by being baptized in Christ for the remission of your sins, or you need to re return to a faithful walk with the Lord, 1 John 1 and verse 9 says, If we uh, confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And if you're here and you're in any way subject to the Lord's invitation, we want you to come right now together we stand and sing.